The Chinese dream is the new slogan that's been put out by Xi Jinping, the incoming Chinese president. And it's interesting for a couple of reasons. For one thing, it's the first Chinese political slogan that makes sense in a long time. It's the first one that we can all try to begin to understand what it means. If you think about it, we had the three represents, which was a major political message of the Jiang Zemin administration. Then we had harmonious society and then the scientific outlook on development, all of which were sort of mystifying, I think, to the Chinese people and of us who are paying attention. So uh, there's a practical concrete quality to this, which is significant because it does seem to reflect what people are talking about here, which is the attempt to try to give individuals in China the opportunity to continue moving ahead economically and perhaps in the direction of political reform. Well, the Chinese dream means, as far as we can tell, a few specific things. I'd say on the one hand, of course, it's about wealth. It's about continuing this economic rise that's gone on over the last 30 years. You know, the age of double-digit growth seems to be behind us, but the key, I think, really the challenge now is, is to make sure that the other 500 million or 600 million people in China who have not yet had uh, the, they've not yet moved into a city, they've not left the farms, that they have the opportunity to, to take that next step. It also means a kind of humility on the part of the government. It means that the government is going to acknowledge that it has a serious corruption problem and that it's going to try to eliminate some of the red tape that interferes with people's ability to start a business or make an investment. So the kind of thing, for instance, that the new Premier Li Keqiang mentioned the other day, that there are 1,700 different actions that the, seven, that the central government has to take, the 1,700 different procedures that require central government approval, and that they're going to try to eliminate some of those. Partly that's a recognition that at every one of those decisions, there's an opportunity for corruption. And then the third piece, and this is important, is about pride in the nation. And this is where this begins to get into foreign policy, because what they're saying is that as a Chinese citizen, you should be proud of your country and its ability to stand up for its rights and its interests and its ability to repel um, incursions from abroad. And this will become a bigger issue for us, I think, in the United States over the next few years. You know, what I think is interesting about the Chinese dream is, is in fact, that it's the first time in a long time that, that what the Chinese citizen is going for is reasonably familiar to us as Americans in the sense that really what a person in China right now is looking to achieve is not all that different than what the American dream sets out to promise. Look, I mean, the American dream is about the possibility of being able to take yourself from nothing and turn yourself into something to be able to actualize whatever it is you want to accomplish in life, whether it's about starting a business or going into government or achieving something um, in the world of ideas. And in China right now, what, what has happened is that the government has gone from exhorting its people to do something to actually making a promise to them and saying that you have the opportunity, in a sense, you have, you have the entitlement to have a dream and to go for it. And it's really a remarkable contrast when you think about where China was 30 years ago. The idea that you could exist as an individual and that you could stake out a desire was a radical idea. I think the fact that the fact that the Chinese dream and the American dream are even coexisting is a remarkable measure of, of how much China has actually moved towards a quote unquote normal country. And um, that is a, a, an astonishing measure of, of where it is today, because 25 years ago, that just would not have been possible. You know, the American dream and the Chinese dream have something significant in common, which is that they are both about the possibility of being able to achieve what it is you set out to accomplish, to go from nothing in life to having something. I think the difference, and this is an important difference, is that the Chinese dream includes a foreign policy component, and that's the idea that it's China's dream to be a strong, significant country on the world stage, and that has now been pushed down to the individual level. And uh, this is going to draw upon the nationalism that we've seen growing in China over the last few years, and I think um, that's a piece that doesn't exist in our American conception of ourselves, at least in an explicit way. So, you know, the challenge is 
for Xi Jinping that he has now set a very high bar for himself, rhetorical bar. And uh, the difference is that in the past, the slogan was what mattered. And I think he's going to discover that, in fact, people are looking for substance. You know, in my conversations around Beijing these days, I talk to people about the Chinese dream because it's a fun, easy way to get people to talk about what they want out of life. And people have really concrete demands. They say, for instance, you know, my next door neighbor has a lawsuit that she's involved with. Actually, she's suing my landlord. And she and I talked about it and she said, you know, I want to be able to go into court with a reasonable assurance that the judge has not been bribed. And I talked to a guy the other day who says, my Chinese dream is to be able to send my child to the United States so that he can get a green card. And um, these are difficult things. In order for all those things to happen, it's going to require a serious political commitment towards reform. I, I do think on some level that the Chinese dream is, is a more powerful idea than even Xi Jinping perhaps thought it was, which is that he thought he was setting out an idea for the country. And in fact, it's been interpreted as the Chinese dreams, plural. It's this concept that, in fact, everybody is entitled to something. And, um, you know, there, there is, as it stands now, there's nothing that fundamentally stands in the way of people being able to get ahead. But the reality is that the political system is... The political system has has run out of its ability to accommodate the incredible diversity of expectations and aspirations that people have in China today. I mean, this is the single greatest obstacle, I think, to China's peaceful, stable future, is that the political system that's currently constituted cannot absorb and accommodate all of this energy that's produced every day by all of these people who are now thinking and desiring and demanding in all these new ways. And it just simply wasn't a force in society 30 years ago. And now that people have sort of achieved a basic level of survivability, they're starting to articulate individual demands in a way that the system is not designed to absorb.